Hello, everyone. I am probably going to mute myself for a second so I can click around, make sure people know I am um, actually going live today. Had to reschedule because I got a migraine. Um, my dog's whining. He's very sad that I got a migraine and she's a she, so I don't know why I said he. But um, hold on one moment. I will mute and do some clickety clacks, but thank you for being here so far as we cover the house of the seven gables, chapters one through four. My cat just knocked over a glass. You can't see him, but he's not walking past me. Ken, one moment. I hope I didn't put the wrong time or anything. Where are all of you? Am I going to be doing this by myself? I seem to be having some technical difficulties on the other end. This is probably going to be really painful to watch back on the replay. Lady, shut up or say something. If I have a concerned look on my face, it's because I'm, I have another tab open for YouTube and I'm trying to, it's not working for some reason. So um, I'm wondering if that's the issue too. Let's see. It says I'm live, but it's not uploading it.
Is anybody here? Is anybody with me? Oof. I'm sorry about the close up of my face. I had to adjust myself. I'm using new headphones too, so I'm kind of wondering um, how they're working, but no one's here to tell me. And again, my YouTube is not uploading, so. That's not what I meant to do. Oh my gosh, the clicking, I am so sorry. So the no one that's here. mute. Okay, I'm just going to get started with myself. Sasha, it's my dog. It's my dog. It's my, it's my dog. She's making a horrible licking sound that gets on my nerves. So today I'm discussing chapters one through four of the House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, wanted to get into seven minutes later. Um, what should I call it? My mind's drawing a blank, just like everything in my life, my bank account, my jokes. Um, the relationship to the Salem witch trials and this book, um, if anyone doesn't already know, Nathaniel Hawthorne is the great grandson of John Hawthorne. And let me pull this up for you. I am going to mute as I click. Hey, always grateful. No worries. Um, once you start the stream on the replay, go ahead and go about seven minutes in because I don't really say anything until then. Hey, Megan, thank you for being here. I'm going to mute as I pull something up. I'm gonna go ahead and make that a large part of the screen so you can see it as well. All right, so the relationship between the Salem witch trials and, um, go ahead and take my Twitter off, and this book, The House of the Seven Gables, the author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, is the great-grandson of Judge, Judge in me. I'm trying to combine the word judge and John, and it is not working. He is a great grandson of John Hawthorne, who was a judge in the Salem witch trials. So um, this kind of gives you an idea of where Nathaniel is coming from with some of the theme of this book, if you will. I'm not quite sure, hopefully later, Always Create Full can help me out with that one. But in the preface of the book, which Nathaniel Hawthorne writes, he even states that um, the book exemplifies the, the morale that the sins of one generation will be passed on to future generations. Um, 
he expresses that he tries not to be too heavy handed or moralistic in this explanation. Um, and he promises not to make too many associations between places and characters of the story. I guess maybe perhaps not literally so, like naming the people in his in his life. But you can see a lot of the similarities between his great grandfather being a judge, and there's a character in the book that's a judge. Um, and it just kind of makes you think of at least in American culture and American history, the, the sins of our past, slavery, um, what we've done to indigenous people and lots of other folks, but just, um, you know, we, we have blood on our hands in this country from the past. So, and I guess from the Salem witch trials as well, we've persecuted the heck out of a lot of people. So you can kind of place yourself in this idea that Nathaniel Hawthorne has on whether or not you believe what he's saying that the sins of our past kind of are passed down by generations. Can we escape this? Is there any escape from this? Who knows? So a quick overview. Again, I'm gonna mute for a moment while, I'm, while I am clicking. Hey, Dina, no problem. We're just going after chapters one through four. So if you ever do want to read, we'll be doing this each week and covering a few more chapters. My dog is running up the stairs, if you can hear her nails. Um, and we've just kind of got into the um, preface that Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote that he has a relationship with the story his great grandfather was one of the judges of the Salem witch trials. And his whole point of this is that the sins of our generations of our family generations or national generations like slavery, what we've done to indigenous people, that kind of um, the sins of previous generations stains future generations. So it's kind of what he prefaced his own book about and he also goes on to say that it is a romance and not quite the fabio kind that's a different romantic demographic but um the difference between novels and romances that either um nathaniel wrote himself or i found somewhere i can't quite remember i just wrote it down and didn't it's not my idea um I didn't put where I got it from. I think it's Nathaniel that wrote this, that novels adhere closely to the framework of everyday circumstances and romances give the writer more freedom to present another version of the truth, which may be enhanced with faucets that transcend reality. Fabio, right? I can't believe it's not Bada. That's what I remember him from. <laughs> Um, Nathaniel goes on to tell us that this book is a mix between the two genres, but primarily a romance. So um, if Clara Bear were here, she would probably agree that this is a really good book in um, altering your consciousness. That sounds like we're doing drugs while we're reading this book and we're not, I mean, I guess, whatever. But um, it transfixes your mind into a different reality. And that kind of helps you better understand everyday experiences, kind of like the whole sense of generation things. Your aunt loved um, romance novels. 
the book covers. Yeah. Um, one time my, my mother-in-law gave me some romance novels. It was a, it was a little bit awkward. Felt like we were trading. I didn't read them. It's too weird. All right. So if I can find that page again, we'll do a little bit of an overview. Okie doke. So chapter one, we get introduced to the old pension family. So there's this farmer, Matthew Mall. He builds a house next to a clear spring in Massachusetts. There's this other landowner named Colonel Pension who wants Mr. Mall's land. So he accuses of him witch of witchcraft and Maul is ultimately convicted and hanged before he dies. And when he does, he sends a warning that um, Pynchon will, God will give Pynchon his own blood to drink. So future generations kind of occupy the Pynchon house. Some people start to kind of suspect that perhaps um, Matthew Maul wasn't the, um, wizard that he was accused of being they could kind of see doc or colonel pension's um, motives for the accusations um so the chapter ends with a few descriptions outside the house of seven gables stands a gigantic elm which is planted over 80 years ago by one of the earliest pensions and a nook between the two gables a cl um, cluster of flowers known as Alice's Posies, named after an old legend that told of Alice Pynchon flinging up f flower seeds for fun, resulting in the flowers that thrive in the dust and the dirt collected on the roof. Now I've, um, what was it? There was a short story, The House, I'm, I'm sorry, A Rose for Emily, where by um, Faulkner, and there was a whole, essay that was done just on the dust of that short story and what it symbolized when it got stirred up when it was still um that it represented time that it represented controversy so i'm curious to see if anyone has any kind of thoughts or theories on the flowers kind of growing from the roof and the dirt and the dust um, going on to a summary of chapter two, the little shop window. So Hebsabah Pension is the old maid that inhab inhabits the house, and she has a permanent scowl on her face due to nearsightedness. She spends quite a time on her appearance. Um, she also has to open what is called a scent shop, which I can actually show this. Um, let's see. Boop, 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 boop. Gonna put my face back in here for a minute. Remove this part. And I will show you photos of the scent shop. So again, if no one knows, the House of the Seven Gables is an actual house in Salem, Massachusetts. Nathaniel Hawthorne did not live there, but his cousin did. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, his birth house and the house he grew up in is still currently up. It's part of the tour that you can take when going to the House of the Seven Gables. The house has a lot of history itself. It was originally like an L-shaped house and there were some adaptations that occurred and some things that were moved. And Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the book about this house, but a lot of things in the book, structurally, architecturally, weren't exactly the same. So the last owner of the house made some adaptations, like including the scent shop. 
so that she could have tours of the house, make money off of it because she knew people would be um, interested in taking tours because of the book. So she wanted to make the house exactly like the book. So she added the scent, scent shop, which was never really used in um, the history of the house and, and for, for its purpose, other than now it's just a kind of a display and um, a way to honor the book and make you feel like you're part of the story when you're in there. I recently toured the house. This is what has created my um, interest and excitement for this book. So let me pull up the scent shop without further ado. Let's see. I've got nearsightedness. Look at that. All right, let me see if I have it up. I do. Sorry again for all the clicking. Here. Oh, oh my goodness. Nope, nope, nope. Not what I want to do. Ah! All right, well, we can pull up the, um, there's a current. Oh, no, it's there. So, yes. This is the scent shop. It was, I believe, added in um, the early 1900s. Um, yeah, Dina, if you also want to, oops, sorry. If you guys want to, I have links in my first introduction announcement that we're doing this book club of free places where you can get online copies of the book. So, you don't even have to go out and purchase it or go to your local library if you don't want to. Um, there's something called the Gutenberg Project. John was nice enough to um, mention that. And there's another one, I think it's called, I, I've got the links in, in the description of the video, but um, I think something called, a website called the Open Library to me had the most intuitive form of the book. You could kind of kind of like a Kindle version. You could kind of flip through it rather than scrolling through like photocopies of it, but whatever you prefer. Um, now, let me show you a more modern day picture. Where, let's see. Let's see if I can help out the share screen. I'm having a little bit of a problem. Here we go. This is from the House of the Seven Gables Facebook page. This is a photo of the scent shop. So right about back here, they have a wall where you just walk up to it. You can't actually go in the scent shop, which is a little disheartening. It'd be fun to like walk back here and act like you're Hebsiba, you know, giving out some gingerbread cookies, some racist gingerbread cookies to the local kids. Yeah, they were Jim Crow gingerbread cookies. All right, so I was going to do some quizzes. Oh, we're not done yet because then we have to get through chapter three and four, the overview. Why don't I just get to the analysis? Why don't we just do that? Maybe. Maybe I'll get to chapters three and four. Okay, so the shop's first visitor, okay, so Hepsiba, she's like been living in this house, higher society, she doesn't have to work, and now her funds are kind of running out and she has to open the scent shop and she really doesn't want to because it's kind of beneath her. Um, what are the local people going to say? She does have a tenant who lives in the house as well. Um, his name is Colgrave, I believe. And he is a, um, mm, let's see if I can pronounce this word. Daguerreotypist. He makes daguerreotypes which are the first known photographs. Something that 
was both frustrating and exhilarating while reading this book is learning all the words. I had to have a dictionary with me while I read this. And I had to use it probably at least once a paragraph, if not sometimes every other sentence. But um, yeah, you learn a little history and um, definitions of words. So this guy was a photographer, basically, because I don't want to keep trying to pronounce that name. Let me make sure to, I'm not muted. I'm not. My name's not Erin. Um, I like rag her every single stream of mine. It's okay, because she never watches them. <laughs> so, photographer. Yes, he's a photographer. He's her first, um, he's not really her first customer. He just kind of comes in and talks to her and gives her advice and, you know, don't worry about this. Don't, um, she's kind of caught up on this label of being a lady and now she's no longer a lady. And he's like, ah, those are labels that kind of restrict you. The world's your oyster sort of thing. She did give him some biscuits. Um, and then this little kid, when I'm talking about the racist gingerbread cookies, she has some Jim Crow, I guess they're Jim Crow shaped cookies um, that this kid keeps coming in and getting more and she's just giving him to giving them to him. Um, so she finally does. Oh, the boy comes back so many times that she's finally like, okay, this kid's going to keep coming back and getting some of my racist gingerbread cookies unless I actually charge him for it. So give me a coin. She gets her first coin and it kind of motivates her. It sparks like, I can do this. This isn't going to be so bad. Yeah. It's kind of like the first seed that starts a new season or a new chapter in her life. Um, she's very hopeful after that. And then she kind of goes through a mixture of emotions throughout the day because she also has two shop owners or not shop owners, two, two townsmen who walk by her shop they don't quite come in. They look at her storefront window, which she's very nervous and anxious about. Did I do it right? Is there enough that catch people's eye? And they're kind of like, oh my gosh, look at this chick. Can you believe the old pension lady is doing a shop? Like, hi, I'm mighty. <laughs> now she's one of us, but also her shop looks like it sucks. So that kind of like puts a damper on her hope right there. I think we can all kind of relate to that, like going out on a new journey, creating a new YouTube channel, like, oh, this is really fun. Oh, look, I got a like. Oh, look, I got a comment. They appreciate. Oh, my gosh, you hate me. Oh, my gosh, you are critiquing my looks. Oh, my gosh, who do I think I am? I can't do this. And, you know, things that everyone thinks about. New What's the word? New journeys in our life. There's a better word for it. I just don't know it because obviously words aren't my strong suit. And that's why I like to say them a lot and read about them and learn about them and have a dictionary and a thesaurus near me all the time because I don't know them. So Chapter four goes through the rest of the afternoon day of shopkeeping. She recognizes a man outside of the window, her cousin, Judge Jaffrey Pynchon. I'm pronouncing it Jaffrey because it's J-A-F-F-R-E. If it's incorrect, um, I'm going to say you're incorrect because... I'm not. So um, I've gotten a little confused on the characters. I don't know if anybody else has. Let me check and see in the stream if anybody else who's read this is here. Nope. Nope. Oh, sorry, Dina. Did you read The Little House on the pra Prairie and Anne of Green Gables books? I learned most of that from them. Um, apologize that I don't know. That the scent shop is that what you're talking about? Um, 
I didn't read any of them, but I did watch um, Little House on the Prairie a lot. Laura. Um, so yeah, some of the characters. So the first dude that built the house, right? On the tainted soil. Um, he, he died. He actually passed away the day that the public opening of his house. So we had this big shindig. Um, I built this house. I'm awesome. Everybody in town needs to come hang out with me. He had invitations to governors. Everybody was there. They're all freaking waiting. He doesn't show up. They're like, um, I'm important. Where are you? And someone finally goes through the door of his study office, whatever, and homeboy's dead with blood on his beard. So it seems like the premonition that the old wizard or not guy that, you know, was hung may not have been so far fetched because it kind of seems like he did choke on his own blood. So, um, the terms back then, I think you would love those books. I read them when I was a little girl. That's awesome. I think I, I remember seeing them. I don't know why I never read them because I was quite a little bookworm growing up. Not so much since kids, but that's why you guys are here. So I'm forced to keep reading. There's all these books that I just want to read and I just... <sighs> But I think you have to live with a purpose, right? The vice principal at my son's school today while dropping everyone off late was like, walk with a purpose. Well, I'm reading with a purpose. I'm doing this. I want to read these books. So I am. I just have to make the time. Okay. It's shocking that I know words. I know. I'm shocked by it too. I really don't though. Um, all right. So yeah, bloody blood blood. Also, just to warn you guys, if you haven't already, I don't know why I keep looking over here. Also, just to let you guys know, the author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, wordy, 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 wordy. To get through the first chapter is a bit difficult. He could just say the door opened, but he doesn't. He says that in about 15 words. But it is beautifully written, and I don't mean like, ah, oh, flowy. It's just, to me, it's kind of clever, and I appreciate that. And I would appreciate it more if I understood the words better. So it might be a little quicker for me to get through the book, but it can be a little bit challenging for those who are, you know, not so understanding of letters smushed together. So, not sure why I'm clicking, let's see. Oh, the bloody beard, yeah, gross, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, I um I've broken up the first two weeks are gonna I think four chapters each, but then the next weeks are just gonna be like two chapters at a time. I kind of wanted this to end like the week of Halloween. Um that way maybe that last week too, wrapping it up, I can kind of show the pictures of the house from the tour that I took and maybe get into more of the history of the house and um I don't know, spooky Halloween, because mm. ah. there might be a ghost or two in the story or not. There's definitely dead people. There's definitely dead people. All right. So just, oh, there's um, an uncle in the town that it's, it's kind of the town town's name for him, Uncle Venner. He's just an old guy that kind of 
shuffles around, takes all day to get to the grocery store, kind of does his little thing, waves to the neighbors. Um, I have, and he had a dialogue with um, Hepzibah, the lady that lives in the house currently, and the story. I'm trying to figure out, I feel like he represents something and I don't get it. And um, so always grateful if you're watching this replay, help help a sister out. Um, so I feel like he represents something that I just don't know. Um, okay, so sorry to ADD this, but Judge Jaffrey, remember I'm correct in that pronunciation, is the cousin to Hepzibah who lives in the house. I think there was, um, like, I think he's the going to be the heir to it, the next heir, but there's something in the clause of the will or whatever that right now his niece, she's the one who is permitted to reside in the house. Um, so Uncle Venner, we don't know what he represents, or at least I don't, other than maybe the town wisdom speaker that's not obvious wonder if it's like a christ figure couldn't be because he's old christ figures are norm normally in their 30s so i don't know um chapter four kind of ends with homegirl hepzibah getting a knock at the door at the end of the day when she's in her shop she's like i don't really know what all this is for this was just like too hard of work. I have mascara on and just, I don't normally wear it and I just rub my eye. So if I have a black eye now, you're welcome for the entertainment. Um, she was wrapping up for the day, like pff, work, dumb. And she sees this broad coming up the street, this man helping her out with some baggage and she's like oh I know no one's about to bring their suitcase up here like I don't have any planned visitors what's this oh and Hepzibah is really um a hermit she never really goes anywhere hasn't really her whole life so that's another kind of obstacle in her way of opening the scent shop um because she's got to interact with people I mean I feel like even the most social person can appreciate that sometimes you just don't want a people So, knock on the door, who it be? Phoebe. Who's Phoebe? I don't know. That's where the chapter ended. I think it's a relative, actually, they say that. She's some kind of a, she's some kind of a cousin or something. Not like me and Sue Emma are cousins. Different. It's different. So, I want to get to some of the symbolism. If I may. Oh, let me see if you guys have said anything. That would probably be kind. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about the bloody beard. I wonder if they do something similar to that in Salem, like, um, you know, Bloody Mirror. Bloody Mirror. Words. Bloody Mary in the mirror. If they do a bloody beard in the library anyway i'll have to research maybe that last week in october when we finish up the book to see what kind of um superstitions or um traditions they have with the house of the seven gables during um halloween october i keep calling the whole month halloween but it is called October. There's only one day called Halloween in October. It's the 31st. It's random. It happens the same day every year. I'm not sure why. Just kidding. But um, let's see where I found the... I don't know if you can hear these weird licking noises. My dog is just... She does this nervous thing where she just... It's really annoying. 
hopefully you guys can't hear it, but I can. It's quite disturbing after I just swallowed like that. Where is the analysis for chapters one, three, two, four, six, and eight? Previous chapters. All right, let's see if I can stream share this. My apologies, being a little confused. I should probably close tabs when I'm done with them so I'm not so freaking confused. Um, analysis. All right. So some of the symbolism is that the spring that was on the property when Matthew Mall owned it was clean and clear and fruitful so you say then when he passed and pension took over his land it became the well became spouting dirty water so it said that that represents maul's curse will be proved to be tied to the ill-gotten land rather than the pension family itself a bit of foreshadowing if you will so the house itself if you'll notice that any pension that leaves the house goes on to have success and thrive anyone that stays in the house like the nephew who was accused of um, committing murder he didn't have such a good life. Hebzibah, the hermit, the one who has this permanent scowl on her face, who's losing money and has to open a scent shop. She isn't living such a good life. So the house itself kind of is, a, um, is symbolic of um, how people are in the pension family are affected. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Yes, it goes on to say Hebzibah has is an old maid that has a permanent scowl on her face. She's a fallen aristocrat. But at the same time, <clears throat> we see that she may indeed have a good heart. I apologize. Let me mute myself and All right, perhaps that will help. Let me make this larger. I think this is a summary and I really wanna to get to the analysis. I apologize. Oh, it is the analysis, okay. So I guess we just see kind of the evolution of Hebzibah a little bit in the first couple chapters. Again, she's a fallen aristocrat, but um, and she's a little bit like this is kind of beneath me owning a shop, but we see that she does have a good heart. Again, she gives the racist gingerbread cookies to the kids. She gives a couple biscuits to her homeboy that lives with her. Not lives with her, lives with her. They're not shacking her up. She, he's just the tenant. So... Hansaba robs the house of some of the mystery the first chapter instilled in it. The house has been represented as a place of great evil where even the waters now run black. But here we see its sole resident as a miserable but not unbearable character running around with a frenzy that is decidedly human. Although the fact that Hebzibah's face has been locked into a frown suggests that she is unhappy at home. My dog just tried to jump on the bed unsuccessfully. Come on. 
Um, so all her activities give the place a sense of hope and renewal. As later chapters will show, this paradox is a fitting introduction to the House of the Seven Gables. Thank you for the spoiler alert, Sparks Notes. So we kind of see that maybe Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author, is suggesting that there is redemption um, from sins of previous generations, that perhaps um, it's not always a permanent stain. Maybe that's where this book is going, and maybe that gives hope for people as a nation and people individually. I personally do not believe that you have to always live with the cloud or the stains of past mistakes. As long as you acknowledge them and do the work to get through them and don't do them again. That's my personal belief and experience. I believe most everything is redeemable. Pardon me, most everything. Let's remove this little bitty from the stream. I'm going to mute again, so don't hear so much of the clicking. And then I'm gonna add another version of um, analysis. We're gonna get to the elm tree. They talk about the pension elm a lot. That's at the, kind of like in the courtyard, I believe, of the home and what that may or may not represent. Alrighty. So right about here, Cliff Notes describes the house and its inhabitants have decayed. So Hebzibah, old maid, her physical appearance has decayed, her finances has decayed, but the elm tree that has grown almost as though it were nourished by the decay of the Pynchon family. The once proud prosperity of the pensions has given way to poverty for most of the family and the original injustice of old Colonel Pynchon has descended as retribution upon the present inhabitants. The elm has grown with each season, but the inhabitants of the house have become stunted. The same things have happened over and over again, but the pensions do not see the retrib retribution has been a continuing curse upon them because their vision is taken up with the more obvious reality of their great house and the social position of which it is a symbol. Consequently, this blindness to reality is represented in Hebzibah's nearsightedness. Ooh, I hadn't read that before. That makes so much sense. I, I kind of just wish, I wish I were so smart. That just makes perfect sense. Why did I not pick up on that before? I'm not muted. <laughs> awesome. And um, hey, Angel Cake, thank you for being here. Um, we're kind of towards the end of the stream and some people have kind of entered and left. Because um, some folks are just here supporting me, thankfully, and haven't quite read the first four chapters. But that's what we're discussing today, the first four chapters of the House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I'm getting to some of the symbolism. Right now I'm talking about the elm tree in front of the home that is flourishing, although the house itself and the inhabitants inside have been decaying. And Cliff Notes is suggesting that perhaps the tree is not only thriving, opposite of the house, but maybe because of the house, maybe it is thriving off the decay of the house. Um, and I was just discussing that I wish I were so clever to understand or be able to write something 
like the symbolicness of symbolicness is probably not a word. That's probably why I can't write such good, better stuff. But um, the Hepzibah's nearsightedness is a representative of just being focused on what's there in front of her, the here and now. I can only be focused on wealth and someone perhaps is going to come rescue me, perhaps that long lost uncle who supposedly went to India and hasn't come back, got all these riches and wealth and maybe he'll come back and share it with me. Um, you know, can't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. Hey, Claire, I'm just kind of wrapping up, getting into the, um, the symbolism of the first four chapters. I can send you a link if you want to come on here and talk about the book. Thank you, Angel Cake. I'm going to narcissistically put this up here. She or he says, that's okay. I'll, I will catch up. Showing you support by the way we rock. Thank you. I love to read and your humor is awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm not trying to be funny. I just kind of am. <laughs> Sounds so rude. Um, I think sometimes just the way that I sound things is funny. Yeah, that was hilarious because that was ridiculous. The way I sound things, no. I sound ridiculous, but the way that I say things sometimes is funny. Lord. The cake is a she. Well, thank you, she. Thank you for being here. And you always make me hungry when I see your name. Completely random ADD moment, but when I was pregnant with my first child, I had a craving for angel food cake, but it couldn't be just that. It had to be angel food cake with strawberries and whipped cream. And you see, it was in the winter time, so strawberries weren't really in season. And even the like gross ones that they have at the grocery store at that time, they were kind of out. And I wouldn't just go to a store and if they didn't have all three of the ingredients, I wouldn't even get one because I didn't want to be disappointed and have it in my face that just I have one of the ingredients and try to go look for the other ones and not be able to find them. Had to have all three. I was ridiculous, but I was pregnant, so it's allowed. Hey, Megan again. All right. So the elm tree. Claire, do you want a link? Or Megan? But I think, Megan, you said you haven't read it, but yet. But if you want to, you can. Anyone. Don't have to. I'm just saying the invitation's there. Um, which one was I on? Here. I'm make it the whole screen. Boop, boop, boop. All right. So consequently, the blindness to reality is represented in Hepzibah's nearsightedness. The house is a setting for the novel. Novel. It is a symbol and it is also a character in the novel. In fact, it is the protagonist in a drama of good and evil. The street is its antagonist. Interesting. The real realization that the house is a character is found in a set of images which personify the house of the seven gables. The outward appearance of the house, we are told, reminds one of a human face. The interior, especially the great chimney in the center, is represented, repeatedly represented in the novel in terms of heart imagery. I don't think I quite picked up on that, but I will believe you, Cliff Notes. There is a certain suggestion in the novel, though, that the humanity and dignity of the house are inseparable from its troubles. This suggestion is found in the contrasting images of light, light and dark. Although storm and sunshine have constituted the history of the house, the darkness of the omnia storm is prevalent. As the venerable mansion grew black in the east wind, the darkness is early foreshadowed. 
Hawthorne describes how the terror and ugliness of Maul's crime darkened the freshly painted walls of the house until it became a gray feudal castle. Interesting, interesting. No problem, Megan. Claire, if you don't if you don't want to come up, that's fine. It's just it's just a suggestion. And it's totally cool. Um I can't say that this stream hasn't necessarily been a train wreck, especially the first seven minutes, but alas. So does anybody else have any theories? I was trying to ask Claire if you have any ideas on this, on who Uncle Venner represents, like the old guy in the neighborhood who just kind of shuffles around and gets from place to place at his own pace. Um, yeah, it it's really good if you did miss the first seven minutes of the stream, because it's basically me just gathering things and clicking and I'm not really discussing anything. Um, if I can figure out how to edit this live stream, then I'll probably take out the first seven minutes, honestly. There's nobody really here anyway, then. <sighs> I muted myself. I didn't want to be like somebody else. We know that goes on the train. Um, yeah, so I was trying to think of who um, Uncle Ven Venner, Venner, Venner represents. I had also shown some pictures of the scent shop, which they added. I think it was added in the early 1900s. It wasn't original to the home. And it was never actually used as a scent shop. It was just used to um, make the home more like the novel for the people that were touring it then and touring it now. Let's see, I will show you. And I hope to. Um, That's the um, scent shop that's in the House of the Seven Gables. I was saying that, um, so right over here next to the, I hope you can see my cursor, kind of next to the pretzels and that edge. Around here is where like, um, I think it was like a half door when you were taking the tour of the home. It, it You couldn't go in the scent shop. You could only look upon it. So I was saying I was earlier that I was a little bummed by that because it would be neat to kind of come behind the counter and pretend to be Hebsba and hand out her races gingerbread cookies. But um oh, and then there's a comment here that I forgot to share earlier by someone who says, I love the scent shop way back in the 1980s and 90s when I worked there. We liked the idea of portraying Hebsba or Phoebe Pension. So this is their photo. Kind of gives you almost a little better view of the scent shop. It was pretty cool. And then right beside this, which again, I I really want to be able to um, share my photos when I can figure out how to upload them. And if you guys are saying anything, just P.S. by the way, I cannot get my YouTube tab to fully load this stream. So um, thank you, Angel Cake. I appreciate it. Hopefully you'll like it. If you have any like questions or ideas um, or theories yourself, just let me know. Ooh. Sorry, let me finish my thoughts. So right beside the scent shot was the original kitchen of the home. I say that with hesitation because I think the kitchen was taken off at one point and added back. 
anyhow, there was like, that was right beside the scent shop and it had um, a fireplace, a brick fireplace where, you know, they cooked and everything, had little pots and pans hanging. Um, but some of the interior bricks of the fireplace were some of the first bricks that were made in America. I really wanted to go touch them, but they wouldn't let me. A weird thing. I just like to, I just like to touch things. Okay, so let's hear Clear S. Bear's theory on Uncle Venner. He is the only one still associating with the pensions. Maybe he represents perseverance or loyalty. That's very, a very good point. I didn't think about that, that he is the only one still associating with them. That's not in the family. Hmm. Did anyone else get like a friend's visual in their head when Phoebe came and knocked on the door at the very end of chapter four? Me either. I totally did. So again, next week, we'll, we will be going over chapters five through eight. It will, again, we'll, we'll see if Tuesday or Thursday works out better. I might, I said Tuesdays originally, but I might do another poll on Twitter to see if one day works particularly better than another. Um, it will probably still be at 10 Eastern Standard Time. That just works for me. And um, thank you, Angel Cake. I appreciate that. You can't imagine friends in this book so far. Yeah, just the Phoebe thing. The only Phoebe I ever think of is, well, you know, Phoebe, smelly cat, nestle it to allows. But, um, which I recently made cookies from scratch from the first time from a Nestle Toll House recipe. And they were pretty good. I can see where she was going with that, or her grandmother. Um, next week is the last week that it will be four chapters. I think from here, from there on out, it will be two chapters a week. I wanted the series, if you will, to end um, the week of Halloween. Just seemed like a good idea. Halloween, spooky, Salem, witch trials, books, history. And then maybe we can have a witch party. Anyway, I don't know if you knew, Claire. I said in the beginning of the stream, I'll answer your question in just a second, um, that Nathaniel Hawthorne, his ties with this book, um, he has ties with the Salem Witch Trial. That's kind of his basis for this book is that Nathaniel Hawthorne's great grandfather, John Hawthorne, was a judge for the Salem witch trials, like actually for real in history. And let me read what Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote in his preface, 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 preface. preface. He states that the book exemplifies the mor morale that the sins of one generation will be passed on to future generations. And um, we were saying earlier that, um, or I was reading earlier, I wasn't saying it, I was regurgitating someone else's smart thoughts, that Hepzibah, the character, was kind of foreshadowing that perhaps um, there is redemption. Um, perhaps Nathaniel is suggest su suggesting that there is redemption because um, he says that Hepzibah's character brings like a human aspect to the home and shows that there is hope because she is kind of humbling herself by um, handing out the racist gingerbread cookies. I will just always call them that from now on. If you don't know what Jim Crow is, you better go look it up. 
one day I'm going to do some video series on that too, because unfortunately it wasn't until my forties that I actually knew those were laws. I learned about Jim Crow when I was in my thirties in college, but, and yes, I wasn't in college in my thirties and I'm in my forties and I only have an associate's degree and I'm going to keep on going. One day I'm going to get my doctorate in either sociology or psychology or social work. I'm definitely going to get my master's in social work. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the best social worker ever. Kind of like this chick who now, who owned this house of seven gables, who was an entrepreneur who made tours for the house took that money and put it into a children's immigrant home. That's the kind of stuff I aspire to be. Can you imagine? You get to own this home, has rich history, there's a novel based on it, it's cool, it's a little freaking haunted, and you get to help people. I would die a happy pension. Okay, anyway, um, maybe I've had too much coffee. Speaking of which, I want another sip. Talk amongst yourselves. Hold on. I had elevator music in my head when I was... Taking a sip. I hope you guys heard that. Telekinesis wise. Um, okay. My favorite word. I've got two. The first word that I liked was I'll pull it back up. I think it was daguerre daguerreotype. The reason I like that word is definitely not its ease of pronunciation. Was that I learned that that was the first um, photograph in history. That's what they were called. The second word I really liked started with an E, and I'll look for it. And I liked that word because it was. A little easier to pronounce than daguerreotype. And that was the um, the job of the the tenant that Hebsabah had. Holgrave. He was a photographer. Um, daguerreotypist. I don't even know if that's actually a word, but it is now. Um, yes. Also, super needed a dictionary, like the whole entire time I was reading this, pretty much every other word. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed learning new words. I enjoyed um, learning how to pronounce those words because I often had to, you know, that's me clicking on the little volume thing. Um, the second word started with an E and I liked it because it, what the word defines is basically a, um, a writing stand, a secretary's, not a secretary's desk, but like a secretary's stand. And the reason I like that is because that's, it's a word that is still currently used. And um, I need something like that currently. And it's helping me search for it because now I can ask people for it blah, 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 and they know what I'm talking about. I'm like, it's like not a desk, but it's like a stamp, but like you still write at it. And, and it's not an ancient word. People still use it today. Let me look it up.
I can't find out what the um, word is. I put it in my voice memos. Because I was like recording as I was reading and looking up. I want to see if I can find that real quick. Um. writing desk or a writing bureau, escritoire. Escritoire. A writing desk or a writing bureau. Let's see if you can hear my fabulous voice. Let's try something real dumb right now. Escritoire. A writing desk or a writing bureau, escritoire. Could you even hear that? Let me see if I can type that word up real quick because I can't even remember how to spell it. All right, I got it. It's E-S-C-R-I-T-O-I-R-E. -E. Escritoire. It's definitely not easy to pronounce. I'm going to write that down so I can put it in the chatty, 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 chatty McChatterson. Thank you, Claire. You're awesome. A small desk or bureau with a writing surface, one with built-in compartments for storing documents and often a hinge slanted front that drops down to provide the writing surface. Yes, that is a term still used today <laughs> because Google and I are tight, I know, right? Besties, man, I couldn't live without Google, at least not efficiently. <laughs> All right, so um, unless anybody has any other questions or theories they want to throw out, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, again, next week will be chapters five through eight. I don't know if Thursday works better. Again, I'll put a poll on Twitter to see if Tuesday or Thursday works better. It's going to be the same time, 10 a.m., because it just works better for me. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's it. I'm excited to read more. This is definitely not an easy read, but it's a very entertaining and stimulating read. Um, I really like the way that he doesn't just give simple explanations or simple descriptions rather, not explanations. He doesn't just say the person went out the door. He very much elaborates. Oh, you had one until five years ago? I could have used it. Why didn't you give it to me? Even though you didn't know I existed then, you still should have given it to me. Oh, <laughs> I will not give you detention. Do not worry. Heck, I was like almost an hour late to your stream last night. Somehow I thought it was at eight. And I just happened to be, okay, clear stream is going to start soon. So I'm going to just mess around on the internet. And then I was like, oh, wait, it says she's live. What? So you are definitely not in detention for sure. Yes, his descriptions are a whole paragraph. As you mentioned before, we were kind of chatting on the phone about it. Um, how many commas, right? Clear is like how many commas before it just needs to have a period and move along. Yes, you had a stream with God last night. Grumpy old dude, not grumpy old man. <laughs> I really liked him. Um, anyway, definitely same time, same place. Perhaps same day. It's either going to be Tuesday or Thursday. Chapters five through eight. Bring your questions, bring your theories, bring your coffee. Don't bring your curses or witchcraft because those don't work around here. Thank you all. I will see you next week when we discuss 
the House of the Seven Gables once again. Goodbye. <laughs>